we use a number of common cases to illustrate what strategy dynamics can actually do. This session just introduces a new venture case in the marine engineering industry. Now, what this case concerns is the uh, requirement for uh, vessels on the, on the oceans to install uh, treatment systems for the ballast water uh, that they carry in their holds. And basically, the way this works is that um, when a ship is laden down with cargo, it sits well down in the, in the water and it's fine and stable. But when you take all the cargo off, it uh, rides up in the water. Uh, and uh, if you did nothing about it, it would uh, run the risk of falling over. So what ships do is they pump uh, water into the uh, tanks in the bottom of the ship to uh, make the ship stable. And for a big ship, this is uh, actually huge, huge quantities of, of water necessary to make the uh, vessel stable. The problem is that uh, that water when it's picked up in the harbours where the ship is docked, will tend to um, suck in with it uh, organisms from the uh, local uh, marine wildlife. And the problem is that uh, when those organisms get transported to other parts of the world and the ship pumps the water out again, then those organisms that don't belong where uh, the ship has uh, docked uh, start invading the local ecosystem and causing all kinds of trouble. There's lots of difficulties, for example, in the Caribbean with uh, lionfish, which don't belong in the Caribbean at all. Uh, they come from another part of the world entirely. So regulations are coming in to require ships to biologically clean that ballast water. Uh, and if you think about it, that's a, that's a pretty major undertaking. I mean, there have been regulations for cleaning oil and crud out of the uh, ballast water for a, a long time, but actually making the water biologically clean would be uh, quite a challenge. So there are various uh, types of technology used for this. One of them is uh, to, to kind of get the uh, organisms to clump together using things called flocculants and then use a magnet to actually attract the, uh, the organisms out of the water. That's Hitachi's uh, technology. Another is to use chlorine treatment, essentially the same way we, we clean swimming pools and jacuzzis and that kind of thing. And uh, the third approach is to use uh, filtration and ultraviolet uh, radiation technology to uh, essentially zap the organisms and, and kill them in the in the water. Uh, so there's competition between these different uh, kinds of technology and the company we're talking about, a company called MMC in uh, Norway, is favouring the last of those types. So what's happening is that there's something called the International Maritime Organisation, which is a, a kind of club of all the shipping nations in the world, essentially. And they set the regulations for the industry worldwide. And they are at the point of approving regulations to require ships to install these, uh, these systems. And this is a big, big expenditure for uh, big vessels. For, for a large ship, the uh, cost of these systems can actually be as much as the ship itself is worth if it's an old ship that's been, uh, been written off. So this is a costly thing to do. And there are lots and lots of different systems from many different suppliers, from uh, very small teams right up to big corporations like Siemens. This is a retrofit challenge. We've got to fit these systems back into ships that have been built over the last 10 or 20 years. And there are 57,000 of these vessels worldwide. And on top of that, all new vessels that get built will have to have these systems installed. The challenge, of course, for any of these suppliers, any of these 50 plus companies, is that they actually have to win the decision from the ship operators to install their particular treatment system. And that's not, not trivial at all. Because it's such a big expenditure and it has big operating cost implications, the ship operators are going to be pretty selective and pretty choosy about which of these systems they uh, have installed. Um, then when you've actually captured a uh, ship owner's decision, you've got a challenge of then selling that system into those ship operators to get them installed in the vessels as fast as possible. Basically, when the regulations come in, there's going to be something like a three to five year time horizon to require the equipment to be be fitted and um, basically the next time a ship comes in for maintenance it's going to have to have the uh, the systems installed so that gives you basically a three to five year window and if if you're selling to a ship operator who has chosen two or three different systems you want to make sure that for each particular vessel that they ask for your system to be uh, to be installed not another of those that they uh, are considering 
then of course you've got to go to the shipyards and the ship designers and get your system specified when uh, new vessels are, are being built. So just to give an idea of the industry structure, this uh, table gives a profile of the number of companies operating uh, fleets of different sizes. So up at the top, you've got about 70 companies operating at least 100 vessels worldwide. And down at the bottom, you've got thousands and thousands of companies just operating uh, a handful of, of vessels. And, and in the middle, you've got mid-sized companies with different numbers as well. So you can see it's an extremely fragmented market into which you're selling. You're trying to sell to two, three, four thousand or more different uh, ship operators. The, the profile of the vessels varies enormously as well. So you've got vessels that would only require relatively small systems, throughputs of 100 cubic meters per hour. And there are probably thousands, maybe even uh, tens of thousands of, of vessels of that kind of size. And for those, the equipment uh, cost it typically in the region of 75,000 euros. Then you go way up to ships whose systems need to process uh, 5,000 cubic meters per hour. Hour. And we're talking here about treating Olympic-sized swimming pools in terms of the volume of water that you're having to treat in these uh, huge container ships and uh, bulk cargo ships. And there you're talking about you know, tens of systems of, of that kind of size, maybe maybe hundreds, but, but certainly not, not thousands. For those really big vessels, the equipment costs will be in the region of, of millions of, of euros. And within those different sizes of vessels, you've got different purposes for which they are being used. So you've got bulk carriers, you've got container uh, ships, you've got uh, ferries, you've got offshore vessels, and all of those have got slightly different requirements for, for how the, sh the system needs to be installed and, and performed. So no supplier can successfully offer all necessary products to serve all those different uh, customer se segments and all those uh, different vessels. So every supplier to its industry is gonna to have to choose where to focus in this uh, marketplace. So what are the questions that a company such as MMC or Siemens has actually got to think about when uh, developing their, their strategy for how to tackle this window of opportunity into this market and the ongoing opportunity for getting their systems adopted in new vessels? Well, first of all, which size of vessels are we going to target? Which ranges of sizes are we going to try and design systems for? How many models of system are we going to develop to try to serve that choice of segments? When we've got systems that are actually uh, developed, we've then got to actually get them approved by the International Maritime um, Organization, the US Coast Guard, and, and maybe other certification authorities. So developing the systems on its own is not quite enough. You've got to get this approval done. And then when you've got approved systems, you've got to find a channel into the market. And there are agents, distributors in this, uh, in this industry who have access to the ship operators. And those agents may act on your behalf to promote your system into the particular segments of the industry that they serve. Now, they may get customers warmed up for you, but in many cases, you're actually going to have to sell on yourself and actually send salespeople to see those uh, those customers. And you will probably have to follow up with those customers to sign up contracts for each of the vessels that the operator has. So how many salespeople do you need? One, three, 30, I mean, could be a wide range of numbers of that, depending on how big you are, how much you can afford, what the potential of the segment is that you're serving and how rapidly you think you can actually grow. Then do you focus on new customers or do you focus on repeat sales when you've signed up, let us say, a small number of large ship operators with lots of vessels, do you say, okay, well, that's uh, that's done that job enough. Let's focus our sales effort now on just signing up the repeat orders from those uh, those customers. Or do you go for smaller customers and focus your effort on signing up more of those? Then, of course, there's a question about what price to charge. Now, these systems are going to be pretty expensive to manufacture, first of all, before you've got experience curve benefits, which drive down unit costs, and before you've got the economies of scale. So where do you price the equipment relative to what it's going to cost you to actually make and supply and install those things? You could adopt a kind of market penetration strategy where you deliberately price at a loss simply in order to get the volume going and get you those experience and, and scale benefits. Then you have the problem of how many uh, engineers to employ. 
even if you outsource the actual manufacturer of the equipment, which, which you can easily do, you still got to have engineers in your business to design exactly how each equipment installation is going to work in the specific vessel into which it's going to be uh, be fitted. So you, you've got that kind of design problem. You've got to supervise the manufacturer, even if you don't do the manufacturing yourself, and that needs engineers. And then you've got to have engineers to supervise the installation and commissioning of the of the equipment after you've um, got the um, equipment ready to install in the vessel. And all of this is going to be very costly. I mean, you're going to have to invest very large amounts of money in R&D to design the systems that you're going to offer to the market. You have to invest more money to take those models through the approval process. Now, you can outsource those activities too, but it's still going to be costly. You're going to have to invest in the sales force and you have to invest in the engineers. Even if you don't manufacture, uh, you're going to have to uh, have some cost up front. And uh, when you've done that, at what rate are you going to generate sales? At what rate are you going to generate margin coming in from those uh, sales? What will profits be? And how will all that uh, work through to the to the free cash flow of the business by the time you've got all the cash outflows with the investment you're having to make before you actually get the cash inflows from the sales of uh, of units that come in and then you're going to get uh, additional revenue from uh, spares and maintenance in the later years so quite a lot of uh, complicated questions and, and decisions you're going to have to take and those decisions are going to have to constantly be revised and updated and adjusted as time goes by in the light of how well your business is doing, how competition is going, how the market demand pattern is emerging uh, and so on. So there's a, a lot of complex uh, dynamic questions that have to be dealt with to implement the strategy for any of the suppliers to this industry.